بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم In the name of Allah the most gracious the most merciful السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وبعد We praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We thank him upon all conditions We ask him to grant us every reason to smile And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us through the difficulties that we may be going through in our lives And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless every single one of us we send complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his entire household, all his companions. May Allah bless them all. And once again, may Allah bless you all and may Allah bless humanity at large. Amin. My brothers and sisters, it's awesome to be here at Masjidul Istiqamah this morning in this beautiful city and country of Singapore. And although I'm not used to the heat and the humidity, but inshallah, as the sweat trickles down my face, so we shall share words of advice regarding the month of Ramadan. At least today, we are not fasting. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, we have a beautiful month ahead of us. How many days remaining? Who can tell me? How many days remaining for the month of Ramadan? How many? I can't hear an answer. 18 days? 18 days. Is that correct? Might be 19. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. 18 to 19 days remaining for the month of Ramadan. So what is it that we are supposed to be doing right now? What is it? We are supposed to be preparing ourselves for this beautiful month of Ramadan in many ways. And we are supposed to be understanding why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has kept this beautiful month for us. Why is it that Allah has kept every year there is a month that comes and it keeps returning. It's a beautiful month that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with. Although we are not supposed to be eating in the month of Ramadan, we have lots of food stored in our fridges in the month of Ramadan. Although we are not supposed to be eating in the month of Ramadan, the food that we do have in the evenings tastes much better than the same food when it is eaten or if it is eaten before or after the month of Ramadan. You and I know this. The blessings of that month begin the moment the moon is sighted or the moment the month is announced. Automatically you feel the blessings of this beautiful month. But none of us has a guarantee that we are going to witness the month. We are going to see this month. Not a single person has a guarantee that he or she will actually see the month of Ramadan. And so many of us, we have witnessed previously months of Ramadan and our lives have not changed. Maybe in Ramadan we became holy, we became pious, we became noble. We read our salah in Ramadan and once we saw the moon for, for Eid, that day Salatul Fajr was not read. Am I right? I heard quite a loud yes. May Allah forgive us. But it's a fact. Then when Ramadan goes, sometimes we put hijab, month of Ramadan, the minute Ramadan goes, hijab is out. So it's like the scarf, it says on there, Ramadan, that's it, you know, subhanallah. The masjid, it says Ramadan outside the masjid. Is this masjid Ramadan? No, 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 it is Masjidul Istiqama. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. If we want to benefit from the beautiful month of Ramadan that is about to come, let us understand, it is the month of fasting, the month of discipline, the month of taqwa, the month of the Quran, the month of developing a link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the month of repentance, the month of making resolutions so that we can lead the rest of the 11 months of the year leading up to the next Ramadan in a way that will please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanallah. So sometimes many of us, we complete the Quran in the month of Ramadan. Is that correct? We read the Quran, we keep a bookmark, and we make sure that we read page by page or we read verse by verse or we do something known as a khatma. Am I right? Is that the word you use here? Khatam or khatma. It's a word that's used, a completion. And we read it and we say, wow, I read one Quran in the month of Ramadan. 
What did you do outside the month of Ramadan? What did you do to the Quran? Is it on your bookshelf? Collecting dust? So one young boy says, no, it's not on my bookshelf. It's in my iPad. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. Today we have the Quran with us wherever we go, yet we do not refer to it. How many of you have the Quran as an application in your phones? Put up your hand. Put up your hand. I can see right to the back there. So put up your hand. You have the I, you have the Quran in your phone? Subhanallah. There you are. Almost all of us. But how many of us read it every single day? Very few. Few. Yet it's in your phone. It's with you wherever you go. Quran. Imagine. The month of the Quran is coming. We are waiting for the month to come. And even then, we will be dilly-dallying. You need discipline. You know, when you are going on a holiday somewhere, you will plan in advance. People already know in the next holidays where we are going. I believe Monday is a public holiday, right? Who knows where they are going on Monday? Put up your hand. Well, I suppose from, a, from the perspective of uh, the control that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has and the fact that His uh, decree is always or always comes to pass no matter what we plan, then definitely we don't know. But many of us have already planned what we are going to do in the December holidays. Do you agree? Yes. We've planned what we will do. We've bought our tickets because Singapore Airlines had a sale. There was an international sale. So no matter which airline it was, we purchased our tickets. We got our accommodation. Brother, I got it at 10% of the price. And I, I've got everything sorted out. I'm taking myself and my family. And sometimes if we cannot afford the journey by air, we will go by road, perhaps across the border or anywhere else in order to enjoy a day or two. We've got it planned and set out. And before we go, we make sure we've got some money, currency. Agree? We've got some money. Who would go on a holiday without money? Anyone? You want to go on a holiday? You don't have cash. Would you go on a holiday? I see we are saying no. But some of the young people, maybe they would take a loan and go. May Allah forgive us. Really. To take a loan just for a holiday is not worth it. Not as Muslims. No. It's something if you, if you need to take a loan in order to go on a holiday, the best thing is don't go on the holiday. Don't go on the holiday. Perhaps spend a bit of time with your family. So we would plan a holiday. We would make sure in advance. If you're going to a hot country, you start planning. If you're going to a country where there might be malaria or dengue flu or fever or whatever it's called, you may want to take the pills in advance. You may want to plan. If you're going to a place where perhaps it's going to be very cold, you will organize and you will get all your warm clothing before you travel. Because you know you want to have a beautiful trip. You will arrange things, organize things. I hope as Muslims, you will also want to know where is the masjid and where is the halal food. Because that's the important uh, cornerstones of a successful holiday. As a Muslim, you cannot have a successful holiday when there is no masjid, no halal food, nothing to eat, nowhere to pray, nothing to do. And so on in terms of your link with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So my brothers and sisters, the point I'm raising is similarly, the month of Ramadan is two, three weeks ahead. We need to prepare. We need to make sure, get your warm clothing for the cold month, if it is. This is just an example. But what I mean is, you will be standing in Salatul Qiyam. How many of you are planning to read Salatul Taraweeh in Ramadan? Please put up your hand. If you are planning to do taraweeh in Ramadan, you, you want to read a few extra raka'at, put up your hand high. I want to see it, please. Mashallah. The reason why I made you put up your hand is so that your hand bears witness for you that yes, I have a good intention and inshallah I will do it. If you die before this, if you die before Ramadan, at least your intention is loud and clear. I was planning to read Salatul Taraweeh. So if you are planning to do taraweeh, and right now, you don't even read your Farad Salah. You won't be able to achieve goodness in Taraweh. I don't know about Singapore, but I know about my country and many other countries. People are looking for the fastest Taraweh. Ferrari, you know. Quick Taraweh. Speedy. Because they are not used to reading Salah. If the Imam takes a little bit longer in Salah, they really feel that this is 
very long and I don't want to go back here tomorrow. Really, that's how it is. The reason why I don't want to go is because the Imam is saying, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin I can't stand that it's too slow for Taraweeh. Everyone is laughing because maybe they might be thinking, hey, that is very slow, man. <laughs> they want, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Maliki Yawmiddin, right? That is correct recitation, but my brother, the one which has a calmness and a coolness, correct recitation, which is, I'm not saying so slow, but which is clear, you can follow it, and it is not a rush, that is what you should be searching for. You will only be able to search for correct recitation if you are bothered about the Quran. So start making yourself bothered about it now. That is the book that will take you into Jannah. It will take you into paradise. Al Quran laka aw alayk. The hadith says this Quran will bear witness for you or against you on the day of judgment. So none of us want the Quran to bear witness against us. That you know, this person did not want to listen to me unless I was recited in a rush. This person did not want to read me at all. Although I was in their phones, although I was with them wherever they went. What a great insult. Whereas if you want to go to Jannah, at least open your app. How many times do we open WhatsApp and, and WeChat and so many other things a day? And all these new uh, links that we have. We open it so many times, Facebook and Twitter, and we refresh it to see who messaged me and who didn't. But the messages from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are also in the same phone. Do you know that? How many times do you see those? How many times do you listen? If I sent you a joke on WhatsApp or on, on your phone, somehow, you would want to listen to it because it's a joke. It's going to make you laugh at the end of the day. But if I send you a verse of the Quran, you might say, you know what? So gloomy, so doomy. You just listen to the, the, the Imam starting and you switch it off and say, I, I shouldn't even have downloaded it. It wasted my, my uh, internet. It wasted the space in my phone and it took away my gigabytes. I'm paying for the service data. That should not be the attitude of a Muslim. We ask Allah to forgive us. That should never be the attitude of a Muslim. You need to develop a link with the Quran so that the Quran takes you into Jannah. You need to learn to read the Quran and its meaning so that it takes you into Jannah. Because it is the word of the owner of Jannah. That's the reason. It is the word of the owner of Jannah. And I've given the young people an example that you know what? If someone you really love sends you a message, no matter how long it is, you want to read it. Why? Because you really love them. Really love them. What about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? He sent you the whole Quran. You don't just read it in the month of Ramadan. Start now. Start today. Pick up the Quran and read one verse every day. Is it too much? Is it too much? One verse. Not more than one verse. One verse every day. Today, you read Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Tomorrow, you can read Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. No problem. The next day, you can read Maliki Yawm din this is the minimum, minimum. You must be thinking that's too little, isn't it? You must be thinking I can read the whole of Surah Al-Fatiha. Read it with its meaning one verse a day at least, minimum. Put a marker. Wallahi, there will come a day when that Quran will bear witness for you because the hadith says, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَّاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئِمْ مَا نَوَى All actions are judged by their underlying intentions. And every person shall be rewarded according to their intention. So if your intention was to complete the Quran and you were reading one verse a day and you die after having read perhaps one chapter out of 114 chapters, you will still be rewarded as though you read the entire Quran because of the consistency, the dedication and the intention. You follow? The consistency, the dedication and the intention. So we need to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us. We need to start somewhere, start today. We don't have a guarantee that we are going to live up to the month of Ramadan. But if I start today, I will be able to at least, I will be able to do something. I will be able to achieve by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one verse every day. When Ramadan comes, you can increase that definitely because good deeds are on sale.
you get a much bigger reward for a good deed done in the month of Ramadan than you would if the same deed was done outside the month of Ramadan. But that does not mean wait for your good deeds. I remember someone asked me a question regarding uh, helping the brothers and sisters who are struggling in Burma. And they said that the Rohinians who need our help, I want to help them financially, but I want to wait until Ramadan so that my reward will be increased. That is wrong. Someone is dying now and you say die now. I will wait for Ramadan. Is that how you should look at it? Allah will reward you more than the reward that you will achieve in the month of Ramadan because he knows your intention was to wait, but the need is immediate. So give it now. Do we follow? The need is immediate. You do not have to wait for the month of Ramadan to give out your charities. You can give it now. And you can also give in the month of Ramadan. If there is a desperate need, you, you use the need to determine when to give. Not necessarily the space and the time. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide us all. So if we are people who are very niggardly, very stingy, we don't like to give even one dollar, five dollars. When the, when the uh, collection comes around, we don't want to give anything. Even one dollar, fifty cents, we don't give. How will we give in the month of Ramadan? Brothers and sisters, when you calculate your zakat, don't be miserly. Don't be a person who says, look, you know what? Uh, it might be 50 or 60 dollars, but let me only use 50 dollars because Allah doesn't need my money. The other 10, I need it more. Astaghfirullah. That's how people think. The young people are very intelligent today. They tell you, does Allah need our money? So the answer is no. So then let me give him less. It's not Allah whom you are giving. It is for the cause of Allah that you are giving. It is for the sake of Allah that you are giving. There are people in greater need than you are. You help them fulfill their need and Allah will help you fulfill yours. When you give a poor person a dollar, you might be helping him build his dunya. But trust me, his dua will help you build your akhirah. Let me translate that into English. When you give a poor person a dollar, you might be helping him in terms of this worldly life, but his prayer for you will help you build your hereafter. That's what it is. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept our wealth. A person who doesn't give before Ramadan, what do they expect to do in the month of Ramadan? So let us start giving from now. Learn to be generous. And remember, the causes of goodness are plenty. There are so many here in our own country as well as elsewhere across the globe. Choose the best cause and give. And someone comes, give again and give again. And don't wait for them to come to you. You ask yourself, where are the good causes that I can give? Let me see. It does not mean you need to be a multimillionaire in order to donate and in order to give a charity. No, one dollar, five dollars, ten dollars we can all afford. Correct? We can all afford. No one has an excuse. Even the little boys and girls, the children, a dollar you can give. Learn to take from your pocket money, one dollar a week or whenever and put it into the donation box from the time you are young. But my brothers and sisters, part of the topic this morning is also to speak about parents and their duty to help prepare the home for the month of Ramadan. My mothers and my fathers who are seated here today, and who may listen to this, I really have a message for you. And that is, if you are going to be generous, your children will learn to be generous. If you encourage your children to give, then they will be giving following your example. But if you are a person who runs away from donating, if you don't talk about it at home, how do you expect your children to follow suit? How do you expect your children to follow this example when they haven't seen that example? So speak to your children about being generous. Speak to them about those who are suffering across the globe and tell them how, how fortunate we are. Remember this. Tell your children how fortunate we are that the few struggles that we may be going through are nothing compared to those in Iraq, in Syria, in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, in Yemen, in Sudan, in so many other countries, in Burma, in Bangladesh, everywhere else. You name them, the number of these countries increasing as we breathe. May Allah help them all. So our children become depressed when they don't have an iPad. Those children are not yet depressed, but they don't even have food and drink and shelter. 
They still have hope in Allah. So look at the depression and look at where it has come. It seeped into the wealthy more than those who don't have. A person who has a home, a roof, electricity, water. In my own country, we barely have electricity and water. It cuts every single day. Every single day, without exception. The electricity goes for a while. And it comes back. But we thank Allah that it comes back. And we thank Allah that we are able to have inverters. We are able to have generators that can generate power for us. We are able to drill boreholes where we can extract the water from the ground for ourselves. We are able to do so many things on our own. So you are living in the literal paradise compared to others, including myself. Subhanallah. May Allah bless us all. May He make us happy people. May He make us those who can appreciate what we have. And one of the biggest gifts that you and I have after Iman is Aman. Aman referring to peace, peace and stability, security. Never ever do anything that will result in the disturbance of the peace, stability, law and order of your community, your nation. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us all. Never be lured into believing that I need to become a violent person in order to be a good Muslim. No way. The best of Muslimin are those who are the most peaceful of us. Islam means peace and it stands for peace. And if really we have a problem, we will deal with it according to the law. We will understand we need to be peace loving people who promote the peace. Ramadan is a month of peace. We achieve so much of calmness in the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that calmness even before Ramadan. May He make us filled with peace. My brothers and sisters, many of us believe that we have huge issues in our lives. Whereas if we compare those issues with other people who are going through real issues, we will realize that ours are nothing. They are eclipsed into thin air. May Allah protect us. May Allah help you and every single one of us, myself included, through all the issues and difficulties we are going through in our own lives. Amen. So if the parent of the home does not read Quran, does not show the importance of the Quran, how do you expect the children to do that? I challenge you, my brothers and sisters, every one of you, early morning as you get up, I hope Salatul Fajr is there. I hope Salatul Fajr is being read. You know, the sun rises quite late. We get up and prepare to go to work. What about Allah? You might not come back from work. You might not get to work. You might leave and go to Allah. Look at the earthquake that happened in Nepal. What happened to them? They were taken suddenly. Can it happen to us? No point in saying, no, we are not in an earthquake zone. These zones can change over time. Only Allah knows. And if not an earthquake, something else can happen. We do not wish it to happen. We pray that it doesn't happen. We pray for peace and calm and stability. But we need to know anything can happen. Even a little car accident. I'm sure a lot of us have lost loved ones or people we know in motor vehicle accidents that were freak. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. Every one of us. We read Salatul Fajr, we should be in the morning. And after that, please, my brothers and sisters, get the Quran itself. You know, someone was asking me, do you get a greater reward to read the Quran from your phone or from... The Mus'haf. You know what's a Mus'haf? The Quran that you see here, the Mus'haf. Definitely you get a bigger reward when you read it from the pages. Indeed. The reason is, for that, you need to be on a level of purity. There is a certain level of respect. You do get a reward when you read it from your phone. No doubt. You definitely get a reward. No doubt. You will get a reward when you read it from your phone. For every letter, 10 rewards. You will get a full reward reading it on your phone. But it is better and more virtuous and more spiritual for you to read it from the book. Open the pages. Pick it from where it is. Make sure there's no dust. Put it in a proper place. And you open it. And please, my brothers and sisters, I'm not supposed to be begging you. I'm not supposed to be pleading with you. But I am telling you, that for the sake of Allah, I'm pleading with you to say, read the word of Allah before you leave your house every day. Even if it means reading one line, one line, just one line. We have not asked for much. All we are doing is developing a link with Allah. A lot of us have no link with Allah. Some of us don't even read Jumu'ah. Some of us, we only on the day of Eid, the only thing we know is to say, Islamat, 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 Hari Raya and whatever else it is. Subhanallah. 
That's the only connection between us and Islam. Sometimes. But every day when you develop a link with Allah, let me tell you what will happen. Allah knows that this is my worshiper. He or she started her day with me. I will be with them for the rest of the day. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Now even if you have a massive car crash through the day and you happen to die, guess where you're going to go? Your day started with Allah. You said Astaghfirullah. You exited the house, Tawakkaltu ala Allah. And after, after that you passed away. People will also remember you that this person read the Quran before they left. They will be inspired by your deed and you will get a full reward for them following your example. Wow. Where did you go? You went to Jannah. Whereas before we leave, we are fighting. As we leave the home, we are swearing. As we go out, we are engaging in adulterous connections with you know, the opposite sex that are unacceptable and so on. And as we go, we want to go into the nightclubs or perhaps gambling. I just got my salary, $5,000. Big salary, mashallah, huge salary. Let me go to the casino to make it 50,000. We go into the casino and we lose all 5,000. Then we borrow from someone to say, you know what? Why don't you lend me X amount so that I can double it up? And we lose even the other amount. What a fool. What a fool. Start your day with Allah. When you get your salary at the end of the month, you will thank Allah and you will budget and you will spend and you will be happy. You can fill your belly with $10 and you can fill your belly with $100. Common factor is your belly is still filled. It all depends on how much you have to spend on food. So if your earnings are such that you are supposed to be filling your belly with $10, but you are greedy to want to fill your belly with $100, you will suffer, you will struggle because you did not budget. And my experience is sometimes the low cost food is far healthier than the high end food. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us understand. But the point that's being raised is lead by example. Leave your home in the morning after having read a verse or two of the Quran in your living area, in your dining room or in your lounge. A place where your children can see you, not privately in your bedroom where they don't know what went on. Let your children see you. It's not showing off. It is teaching them to, to, to live by example. When you want to read Salah in a way that your children see you and they can follow you and you can do Jama'ah and you have read all together as a family, that is, big, that is the encouragement. You will be rewarded for your children doing that in your absence. This is how to prepare for the month of Ramadan. If the father himself is lazy to go to the masjid and the mother doesn't want to go for tadkira or sharahan or taraweeh, whatever else you call it, how do you expect the children? They won't want it. But you show the excitement. You show that, oh wow, I'm so excited. They will want to come to the talk because you show the excitement whenever that talk comes. And I'm sure you know what I'm talking about here. Today, for example, I was excited to come to this masjid as I entered, I felt the heat and I said, I wonder if I will be able to speak. Then I reminded myself, you are here for Allah. No matter how hot it is, you are here for Allah. Ask Allah to help you and start. So I came in, Bismillah, and I started speaking with excitement. You saw the smile when I started? It's because when I saw brothers and sisters, I felt the love. Wallahi, I felt the love. Subhanallah. I can feel a bond, a connection. Everyone's looking and the eyes are genuine. They're looking in order to learn something. We are here to learn. We want to be better people. We want to be able to serve Allah through reaching out to the rest of humanity and the creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're living in a minority. We must reach out to those who are in majority here in a beautiful way. Subhanallah. So I was excited and I'm sure I see a lot of young people here. They must have been excited as well. Excited, subhanallah. I remember someone said, oh, I'm so excited to see you. I said, more than to see me, I hope it is to hear the message. Allahu Akbar. To hear the message, whether it comes from me or someone else, a good message is a good message. So if we lead by example and we show a keen interest in the home for certain things, then the children will follow. But if we are on our phones ourselves and we are busy following the soaps, we are busy following the movies, and we all know the latest of all the songs and everything else. Your children will become experts in the same field and they will overtake you in that field. So you knew all the dirty songs 
Guess what? Your children are writing new songs that are even dirtier. But if you were interested in the Quran in your home, you never had something bad and evil and you were ashamed of anything that was bad and evil because Allah placed on your shoulders the duty of being a role model to your children. So you realized I need to be a role model to my children. So let me now. It doesn't mean you need to roll and become a model. No, no, no. A role model has nothing to do with rolling or modeling. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. It's got to do with leading by example for your own kids, for your own family. It's your duty. If the father of the home is never in the home, it's not a home, it's just a house. If the mother of the home doesn't have the time to spend speaking to the children or the father, it's not a home, it's just a, it's a mere accommodation. That's what it is. It's just a roof. That's what it's a bedding. To make it a home, you need to have a family. To make it a family, you need to have communication. To be able to communicate, you need to spend time with each other. You need to put your phone aside. Turn off the Wi-Fi of your house, 10 o'clock at night, off. 9 o'clock at night, switch it off. So that you are not on your phone and your kids are also not. We tell our children, you are on the phone whole day, whole night. You know what? If they could, they would say, Mom, you're on the phone whole day, whole night, every day, every night. I'm only on it once in a while. But if mom says nine o'clock, we turn it off. I'm off. You guys are off. Someone is dying. They will call you. They will phone you. I know the excuses. People say, no, I leave everything on because what if someone is dying? What if someone is dying? If they're dying, they will call you. There are so many ways of getting hold of you. But if you don't have time because everything is to do with the internet and why do you have a family? What's the point? You're wasting time. May Allah help us to help our children. May Allah help us to help ourselves and then help our children. And wallahi, my brothers and sisters, the globe is struggling today. People are being brainwashed into extremism. You know, one of the reasons is the family unit is no longer as solid as it was. If the family unit is solid and the communication is good and there is a decent understanding and we go to pray together and we go to listen to our lectures together, we will be able to guideline our children. We will be able to guide our children in and go to places that are meaningful where they will have a balanced upbringing and they don't have to resort to something that is bad and evil. They don't have to do things behind our backs because we have a good communication. The minute their mind is deviating slightly, we will pick it up in the discussion we have with them because we have daily discussions. A lot of us do not have daily discussions with our children. I asked one man, do you ever kiss your daughters? He says, daughters? No ways. You don't kiss your daughters. No. How can I do that? I say, why not? I'm not talking about kissing them on the lips. No, we're talking about kissing them on the forehead, kissing them on the hand, embracing them, telling them, I love you. I love you so much. I miss you. Send them a message. Your daughters are growing up. Your sons. How many of us have teenage sons? We never message them. They've got phones. They get messages from the whole world. They never got a message from dad. Maybe not even from mom sometimes. Message them. I'm at work thinking about you. Love you. Miss you. Wallahi, see what it does for you and your home. See. Don't be the old school. We say, how can I say I love you to my children? What, what do they mean? You know, I remember the old man. One day I gave a talk about how important it is to say I love you to your wife. He came back to me and he says, I've never ever said I love you to her. But I know she loves me. And I said, uncle, your generation is already gone. You are one of those who are fortunate to have remained behind. New generation. You need to say it 20 times a day, minimum, minimum. That's why everything is free. Subhanallah, the internet free, WhatsApp calling free, because they know you have to send it. But the problem is we send it to the wrong number. We send it to the wrong number. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us, really. It's something important, something good to learn. Remember to use your tongue just like dhikr of Allah is a very great act of worship. To say good words to your children is a very great act of worship. One day the Prophet ﷺ kissed Al-Hasan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu when he was a baby. That was his grandson. So Al-Aqra ibn Habis was sitting near him and he says, you kissed your grandson. I have 10 of them. I haven't kissed even one. The Prophet says, man la yarham la yurham. 
Whoever doesn't show mercy will not be shown mercy. These are my children. These are my grandchildren. I will kiss them. So to kiss your children is a sunnah. It's an act of worship. It is an act of worship. If to kiss your children is an act of worship, imagine what type of an act of worship it would be to kiss your wife. Allahu Akbar. Or husband. MashaAllah. May Allah help us. Please don't do that in public. It needs to be done in private. I always believe those who do it in public, in private, they don't really get along. This is just showing that we get along. Those who really love each other don't need to show. They know. So my brothers and sisters, this issue of reading the Quran in order to lead by example, even a little bit every day, to start your day with a good deed, to read a dua or two, how many of us sit to eat together as a family? How many of us? Very few. And we say, no, Singapore, you know, it's the, life is very difficult, it's fast, we need to go to work early. No, you make the time to have at least one meal together. Start off with Bismillah, aloud. How simple it is. That's the minimum dua, minimum dua is to say Bismillah. If you want, you can say it in English, Oh Allah, I thank you for the meal you've given me. I thank you for the food that you've blessed us with and the drink that you've granted us. Say it so your children know that every time my father or my mother eats or drinks, they thank Allah. So let me do the same. And they relate it to Allah. Oh Allah, it's you who has blessed, this, blessed us with this. How many of us say Bismillah before we eat? We just munch straight. You bought your burger and it's in, gone. You've eaten it and that's it. No Bismillah. Sometimes it's so unhealthy, you are supposed to be saying, A'udhu Billah. May Allah forgive us. Some of these fast foods are so unhealthy that you are supposed to be saying, A'udhu Billah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect us from the evil of the food. Astaghfirullah. None of us is perfect but at the same time these reminders should be able to encourage us brothers and sisters we all want to see solutions in our homes happy homes happy life happy dunya happy akhira jannah we want to be people who are smiling well it starts off by fulfilling your responsibilities responsibilities unto allah to your family and to the rest of society and how will you be able to do that live a straightforward life so when i'm eating bismillah i have a meal together do you know what is iftar at the end of the fast, every day you have iftar. A lot of us like to use dates, correct? Dates and water. So we say Bismillah and we want to start eating. Make it a family affair. Get together as a family. Make a dua to Allah because that is a time of acceptance of dua and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance and goodness. Let's talk about it to our children. My son, what type of a dua would you like to make? You'll be surprised what your son says. Some of us, the son will say, Dad, I can't tell you because you're going to get angry. What type of a dua would that be? May Allah forgive us. I hope that's not the case with us. Imagine no communication with your children such that when you ask them, what are the types of duas you would make? Let me make dua for you also. What is the dua you want accepted? And the son tells you, I want Allah to take you away as soon as possible because you stress me in my life. Some of us, that's how our children would probably react. Wallahi, without a joke. Because we played only a negative role in their lives. Never a positive one. So let's make it a family affair. We get together, we pray together, we, we eat together. And this is Ramadan. Ramadan gives you the opportunity because you need to get up at a time when there is no excuse not to be together. And that is for suhoor. What time is suhoor? Very early. You cannot say, I need to go to work. No. You are there. Get up, get the people up. Don't be groggy. Hey, why did you wake me up? No, get up and make it something good. Don't be lazy. Many of us get up for suhoor and we will eat up to Salatul Fajr and then we sleep like a log and we don't read Salatul Fajr. Do you know that? Salatul Fajr is gone, but you were eating up to Adhan. You heard the Adhan and you went to sleep. What's the problem? Don't let the devil overtake you. People say the devil is tied in the month of Ramadan. Trust me, those little ones are still running around. It's the big ones that are tied. May Allah forgive us. We cannot do this. We need to encourage one another. Let's build our character and conduct. The Prophet ﷺ was very generous in the month of Ramadan. Extremely generous. He used to give so much so that you know the wind blowing? 
If we are all seated here and the wind blows, very strong wind, it will reach every one of us, right? Everyone will be able to say it's windy. The wind is, it's wind, you know. The wind is generous, so to speak, in the sense that it reaches everyone. The Prophet Sallallahu generosity is described in the hadith where the Sahaba say, he was more generous than the wind that was blowing strong. More generous. He used to give. He was a kind-hearted person. May Allah help us in every single way. My brothers and sisters, the Quran, the duty that we have towards it is not just to recite it, not just to recite it, but it is to try and understand it, to implement it, to convey the message. A person was asking me, telling me, you know what, I cannot concentrate much in Salah. Can you give me a remedy? Concentration in Salah, you see Shaitan, Shaitan is a, an expert in his field, you know, he has a PhD in his field. Shaitan has a very high degree in his field, you know what he does? He knows that now you are trying to plug with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So as you're standing in salah and you say Allahu Akbar, he comes to you and he says, Hey, your phone is going to ring just now. So now you're worried about your phone ringing. Then he says, you know, it's getting a bit late. So now you're worried about the time. Then he says, immediately after this, you have a meeting. So now you're worried about the meeting. Then he says, you're going to need to go and eat just now. The food is getting cold. He says, now you're worried about the food and it getting cold. Then he says, you know, there is a sale somewhere down at the other shop. You need to go and buy the stuff before it is sold out. So now you're worried about the sale and the products. And Shaitan keeps on. And when the Imam says, Dalin, we say, Ameen. We don't even know whether it's the end of Surah Al-Fatiha or another verse in the Quran. In Ramadan, I have witnessed the verses of the Quran that end with Dalin. There are verses of the Quran that end with Dalin. So sometimes people are sleeping in Salah, literally sleeping. And the Imam is not reading Surah Al-Fatiha, but in another place in the Quran. And he says, Dalin. And guys are saying, Amin. But hang on, this is not even Surah Al-Fatiha. This is somewhere else in the Quran. But because we are tuned and trained that once you hear Dalin, you must just say Amin. That's not what it is. It shows that concentration is zero. Zero. Cannot do that. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. Concentrate on the words. So I answered the young man by saying, in order to maximize the concentration in salah, there are many remedies that we are, being, we are taught. One of them is, try and understand what you are saying in salah. When you start Allahu Akbar, what is the dua you make? What does it mean? What am I saying? Surah Al-Fatiha, when I go into Ruku' Subhana Rabbi al azim what does it mean? What am I saying? Why am I saying it? When I get up, Sami Allahu Liman Hamida, what does it mean? Why do I say Rabbana wa lak alhamd or Rabbana lak alhamd? Why do I say that? And what does it mean? So when you learn the meaning of it, inshallah your concentration will be maximized because now you know what you're saying. If you don't know the meaning, you just come forth and you just hear Ba'alin and you say Ameen. That's the type of Salah. May Allah forgive us. So I want you to make a resolution. I want you to promise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that this Ramadan, you will start learning the meanings of, the, of what you are saying in Salah. It's easy to get books online. You can Google it exactly as I, I said it. And when you get the source, make sure it's an authentic source. Meanings of the words of Salah, of my prayer, and go into it. If you want, start today. So that at least when Ramadan comes, you will concentrate. Those who love or those who understand the Quran, they love the recitation of the Quran because they know what it means. They are moved by it. Those who don't understand it and don't want to understand it, they become tired when the Imam takes 45 seconds more in the units of Salah. 45 seconds more. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. We are worried about seconds and minutes. I promise you the amount of people who look at their clocks when it comes to salah, taraweeh in Ramadan is unbelievable. I think we should be having a notice on every masjid door to say like you remove your shoes, 
leave your watches outside. No time must be told inside this masjid. That's it. We would enjoy our prayer much more. Leave your watch at home. Don't look at the time. This is Allah. But a lot of us time. I remember reading Salah. And I remember clearly there was a man next to me. And every little while he looks at his clock. And he's shaking his head. And I'm thinking what's going on? You in Salah. The Imam is reading. You're looking at your clock and shaking your head. Instead of Abdullah, you've become Abdul clock. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. There are many Abdul clocks that appear in Ramadan. We're worshipping the clock every little while. Look at it, look at it. Yes, if there is something really wrong, like you know, for example, the Imam starts reading a long surah and he just doesn't end. Maybe you might want to raise the issue to say, you know, mashallah, you read very well, alhamdulillah. Or you want to raise it with someone to say, I think it was a little bit long because there are some old people, there are some children, there are some this and that, whatever, but in a nice way. But if for every small thing, you see, there is a hadith that says the imam must be considerate of the elderly. That does not mean he must read alif, ba, ta, tha and go down. No. Some people think because the Prophet says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Imam must be considerate. So every rak'ah must be, Inna atayna akal kawthar, fasalli li rabbika wanhar, Inna shani akahu wal abtar, Allahu Akbar, because I'm considerate of the old people I'm reading, Inna atayna. No. That is a wrong interpretation. Look at the sunnah recitations, the sunnah recitals of all the salah. Fajr is meant to be slightly longer. Zohar is meant to be a long salah. Maghrib is a short salah. Isha is a slightly longer salah. Which means if you cannot cope because you are old, get a chair and sit. But do not let people cut down on the sunnah. I hope we've understood the meaning here. People misinterpret it. Some scholars also misinterpret it. They say, brother, you're reading too long. Brother, I'm reading the sunnah. This is the sunnah recitation. I'm supposed to be reading these surahs or this length in salah. And in Taraweeh, for example, well, let's talk about Salah and Farad first. So if you want me to, if I'm going beyond the Sunnah, you can encourage me to cut to the Sunnah. But if you want me to read Inna Atayna every single Salah, then trust me, that is not what is meant by the Hadith, which says, take into consideration the elderly and the women and the children and so on, and the sickly. May Allah forgive us. So let's become... A little bit more active when it comes to acts of worship. When there is a football game, we get excited. We will watch the match up to late at night. And we don't mind. World Cup season comes the whole month. We are watching. We've got our teams. We are following people we don't know. And we are following people. If they saw us, they wouldn't even want to know us. And we're following them like they're our gods. Astaghfirullah. And when there is a season of Ramadan, which is more important than the World Cup season, we're not interested. I'm not saying you're not allowed to know what's happening with sports and to participate perhaps within, within beautiful limits and so on. You can. You should to a certain extent. But don't get carried away. Never get carried away. You understand your limits. Understand that you have priorities. Prioritize. And Allah will open your doors. So inshallah we are making some resolutions here that we will start by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala learning what we are saying in salah is that fine have we agreed alhamdulillah alhamdulillah i hope and pray that you will hold yourself accountable for your own yes maybe that's why some of us just kept quiet isn't it have we all agreed yes. mashallah remember you said yes when you look in the mirror tell yourself i said yes i, I said yes let me go back so every time you look in the mirror, remind yourself, hey, I said I will learn the meanings of salah. We read five salah a day. I hope so. Some of us just read four and three. Some read two. Some read five a week. Some read five a year. You know, when we say there is Muslims should read five salah. Some people translate it as a day, a week, a month, a year. One wonders a lifetime. Allah knows best. May Allah forgive us. It is every single day. Wallahi, the benefit of prayer is huge. It is so big that you won't believe us for you. It brings about calmness. When you can go into the prostration position known as sajda for the sake of Allah and you can declare his praise in that position and remain in there with a beautiful feeling, you see how you feel when you get up. 
you feel like Allah is yours and you belong to Allah. And that is the case. You feel so good. When we feel far from Allah, it's because we are the ones who've distanced ourselves. We don't want to read one line a day. I told you one line of the Quran a day, one line. It's no one can say that that's too much. Subhanallah. May Allah make it easy for us to fulfill. Then another very important point. If you want to fast correctly in the month of Ramadan, firstly, thank Allah you're living in Singapore because go and study the lives of those who are in Northern Europe. They have a fast 23 hours, 19 hours. Some countries they don't see. Some countries do not see the sunrise or the sunset because their sunrise and sunset, the day is three months long, few months long. Go and read about it. What do they do? Well, they have to make a plan according to their systems. But with us, we've never faced that problem. How long is the fast this year? I think it's quite short. 14 hours, 13 hours. I don't think it's going to be more than that. That's not much. Trust me, if the doctor tells you you need to lose weight, what happens? We'll stay away from everything. And we will exercise. You know, taraweeh is not exercise. But at least our postures are corrected. At least we feel, you know, that, that we have gone down for the sake of Allah. If, the, if your trainer in the gym tells you to jump for one hour, you will jump for one whole hour. You will sweat it out. And you will, be, you will, have, you will need a shower after that. And you will be so excited about doing it. And you'll go back the next day. Nobody asked you to jump in the masjid for one hour. Nobody asked you to sweat so badly. No. We were just asked to go into a different position to stand. Allah asked you to abstain from food morning to evening. And trust me, when you break your fast in the evening, that's not a sign of doing qada for the lunch that you missed. No. You have a simple meal. Those who succeed to fast in the most correct way in Ramadan are those who cut down their food in the month of Ramadan. Cut down your food. Eat less. For suhoor, you will be able to have a beautiful day without feeling much that you are fasting. But if right in the morning, before you start the fast, you have had a heavy meal, what happens? The enzymes are digesting, the energy required to digest and everything is happening and acidity is building. By 10 o'clock in the morning, your belly is rumbling because it's calling for more food. Because you had a very heavy meal. So the sunnah is to have a light meal early morning. Suhoor is only for purposes of barakah. So you have something that takes long to digest, perhaps grains, perhaps a bit of uh, porridge or cereal, a little bit of milk, maybe some water, some dates, perhaps dates are high in iron and fiber and so on, and a little bit. And then you see how your day goes because your stomach will not rumble at 10 o'clock. Your energies are used to digest food. So when you have little of it, less energy is used. But we make a mistake. It's like, it's like we, want, we think, okay, I need to hold my breath. So let me take a deep breath. So we take a deep breath. Food is not the same. It doesn't mean I'm not going to be eating up to 7 o'clock in the evening. So let me have as much as I can early morning. No, that's not how it works with food. It actually works the other way. When you eat less, you are less prone to becoming hungry, hungry quick. Remember this. It's one of the secrets of fasting. When we say secrets, we don't mean hidden in a closet. But what we mean is something that you need to know that a lot of people are unaware of. And in the evening, if you want to read taraweeh correctly, make sure your iftar is light. You know, if you are going to eat a whole load of biryani and you know, this beautiful rice and everything else that comes with and everything else they, they, they mention, and you have a whole pile of it in the evening and your belly is popping out, you know, you, you think you're going to read Salat al taraweeh you will start Allahu Akbar and firstly your hands are tied like one meter in front of you because that's your belly, you know. Ah. Ah. May Allah forgive us. And a little while later, we are all the gas is building up in the belly and so on. And then this man is disturbing us with his burping and we are disturbing him like a competition. And the masjid smells of food. Astaghfirullah. Be a respectable person. That is not how you should treat Ramadan. That is not the case. Have a light meal. Have something healthy. Some of us have fried food as soon as we open the fast you know we have savories or fries and so on 
do you know that that is probably the most unhealthy thing you could ever have on an empty stomach? The healthiest thing, water, dates, a bit of yogurt, perhaps a bit of bread. Subhanallah. That is extremely healthy. In fact, it's part of the sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The water and the dates and so on, a little bit of bread and some yogurt. Subhanallah, amazing. But with us, no, we must have all these fries. You know, they call them pies and samosas and whatever else. I'm not too sure in this part of the world what exactly you have. But it looks nice. It, that is the most unhealthy thing ever, ever, ever that you could have had on an empty stomach. May Allah forgive us. So we need to learn some discipline. And this brings me to the entire purpose of the month of Ramadan. Ya ayyuha al-lazeena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala al-lazeena min qablikum la'allakum tattakoon. O you who believe, fasting has been prescribed upon you just as it was prescribed upon those before you in order that you achieve the consciousness of Allah. In order that you discipline yourselves within the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So fasting is all about discipline, getting close to Allah. If I can read so much extra salah in Ramadan, at least outside Ramadan, I can fulfill my, my five farah. If I can abstain from all food, in Ramadan, then at least out of Ramadan, I can abstain from haram. Subhanallah. May Allah help us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. My brothers and sisters, it's been a beautiful morning. As much as I thought it would be so hot. Yes, it is very hot. But somehow we managed to carry on by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I've spoken already for almost an hour. And I'd like to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to having met with my brothers and sisters in this beautiful country of Singapore. And obviously we will still be having a few more programs. And I thank you for your attentiveness and the fact that you've been sitting as well in the same heat that I'm standing in. But at the same time, with all the smiles and all the faces and all the warmth that I feel from this beautiful place, I ask Allah to accept it from all of us. And I hope and pray that Allah can help us to become better people. The month of Ramadan is ahead of us. Do something about it now. Don't wait and say, well, when Ramadan comes, this is what will happen. And that's what will happen. Become regular with your salah now. Start fasting twice a week. You know the sunnah fast? Monday and Thursday. Start it. Start fasting Monday and Thursday. Today we are on a Saturday. Agree? This is a Saturday. Sunday is tomorrow. Plan from now that the sunnah fast for the Monday, I will fast it and fast a Monday, just a Monday, subhanallah. And then you will have a break Tuesday, Wednesday, and then fast the Thursday. See what it does for you. See what it does. It will bring you close to Allah. You will be able to abstain from sin because you are fasting. And if you make it a habit, it's a sunnah that will take you straight to Jannah by the will of Allah. It will take you to paradise. It will open your doors. So start the voluntary fast. If you cannot do it every Monday and Thursday, at least sometime. Once in a while, get up for tahajjud. You know what is salatul tahajjud? Subhanallah. The salah slightly before the, the pre-dawn prayer. The fajr. You just before fajr. May Allah open your doors. So remember, let's lead by example. Let us liven our homes. Make them beautiful places where we have good communication. We smile at each other. We fulfill each other's rights. We love our kids and we tell them. We love our family members. We tell them. Our parents, we make it easy for them. We tell them how much we love them and appreciate them. And we should be, by the will of Allah, doing things collectively as a family as well. Very important points we've raised this morning. I hope Allah makes it easy for me to put it into practice. And for every one of you, inshallah, until we meet again. Sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdika. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.